Passenger Rail Advisory Committee. I'm Mayor David Markowitz. I want to thank everyone for coming out this evening. Um, I wanted to begin by first uh, doing uh, some quick introductions of uh, committee members who are here tonight. Um, if you wanted to, uh, maybe I'll start with you, Adam, and have you give your name, address, and then your affiliation um, being here on the committee. Yeah, we have one. Hi, my name is uh, Adam Novit. Um, just off of King Street, and I'm here representing Ward 1. I'm, I'm Joan Rasool, 96 North East, and uh, I'm representing Ward 3. And just, and just by way of that, I, I asked the Ward 1 Neighborhood Association and the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association to nominate a representative from each of their two groups. So these are the two representatives. My name is Craig Delapena. I'm here representing the Historical Commission, which our chair, David, is here this evening. And my real claim to fame, though, in this world is that uh, I was the first paying tenant in Worcester's restored Union Station. Uh, I know exactly what went wrong and what can go right. Demo the uh, the old UMass warehouse and put a bus terminal. At least there's one. Hand goes there. Transit authority. Oh, I don't know that. I haven't been there in two and a half. Controversy already. I'm Jack Finn. I'm from uh, 57 King Street. Uh, live above my store there. I'm also a representative of the business improvement district. You want to say the name of your store? AZ Science and Learning. Yeah. Jim Nash, uh, 18 Montview. Um, I'm here representing, I, I'm part of the, the, J, the Chamber's Economic Development Committee. I'm also part of the Public Transportation uh, Subcommittee, and uh, I've long been interested in seeing the train come back to Northampton. Curry Philippides, and I work for the mayor. We have two members who couldn't be with us uh, this evening, uh, Mark Warner um, and Devin Bruce from the Planning Board had other commitments that couldn't be here. Um, tonight's meeting is really a sort of a kickoff, I think, to the convert to the public conversation around the return of passenger rail uh, to, to Northampton. And so one of the things we wanted to do for this first meeting to kind of set the table, uh, not only for the committee but for the public, was to have some presentations about um, about sort of the, the overall knowledge corridor project and then some specific information about what's going to be happening in Massachusetts and here in Northampton. So I was going to first turn it over to Dana Roscoe, who's a transportation manager with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, uh, to just give us a quick, uh, quick overview on the knowledge corridor. Thank you, Mayor. I'm Dana Roscoe from the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Uh, I'm going to talk... Um, about the corridor uh, in its entirety from uh, New Haven uh, to Montreal. And I'm going to uh, intentionally uh, not talk about uh, the Massachusetts section. Uh, I'm going to leave that uh, to uh, Tim Doherty and Jody uh, Ray, who are here from MassDOT. So when, when we look at the corridor uh, from uh, New York to Montreal, uh, the, the, the part of the project that we've probably been working the longest on uh, is the highlighted blue section in the middle of the New Haven uh, to Springfield. Uh, Tim uh, Doherty worked for PDPC um, back uh, in the 90s, and this was a project uh, that he uh, was active on, and uh, we continue to uh, struggle. Uh, well, I think we're, we're making some progress. So. So the vision here uh, is to be able to get from New York to Boston some way other than uh, the current uh, route, which takes you uh, through New London and Providence. Uh, we've had uh, issues with flooding, uh, issues with capacity. Uh, and so what, what uh, Connecticut uh, and folks in Massachusetts are looking at is 
an inland route that would take you from New Haven uh, to Springfield to Boston. We're also uh, very interested in that uh, Montreal link. Um, when the train uh, came through uh, Northampton back uh, in the 80s, it did continue on. Some of you will recall it was called the Montrealer. It did continue to Montreal. Uh, when service was discontinued on the on the Con River line, uh, that uh, Montreal link was uh, eliminated, and the train only uh, drove as far as St. Albans. So, um, if, we, if we're looking south, uh, New Haven uh, to Springfield, uh, what uh, the, the Connecticut proposal uh, entails is uh, restoration of 62 miles of track. Uh, rebuilding and upgrading the, the rail, 12, 12 stations, four new stations, uh, uh, improved uh, passenger services, amenities, uh, and obviously uh, a continuation of the existing uh, freight service. Uh, long term, we're looking to go from six trips a day, uh, that's round trips to 25 uh, round trips a day, and during peak periods of the day, uh, have 30-minute uh, service with hourly service during the off-peak. So if we look specifically at what we have today versus what we're envisioning, say, uh, by 2030, uh, there uh, at the top you see are the six trips a day, uh, and they're broken out. Uh, four trips a day are uh, between Springfield uh, and New Haven. Uh, there's one train a day that goes to Washington. Uh, there's actually two trains a day that go to Washington, and that's the breakdown. Uh, the breakdown uh, that's envisioned uh, is 14 trips a day uh, between New Haven and Springfield. Uh, an increase uh, of uh, service uh, to uh, Washington. And as I mentioned before, uh, there would be uh, those three trips a day that would be going from New Haven, Springfield uh, to Boston, and those uh, are also expected to be Washington <coughs> trips. So you, you see the, uh, the vision here um, really uh, has um, an impact uh, for Springfield uh, and you know a, a, a modest uh, impact uh, on a station like Northampton. Uh, in terms of travel, uh, the, the trip uh, from Springfield uh, to uh, New York right now is three hours and 20 minutes, and uh, under the uh, improved conditions, uh, they're estimating a travel time of two hours and 49 minutes. So we're, we're looking at like a half hour uh, reduction in the, in the trip time from uh, what exists today. Um, the, similar to, to what we will be doing uh, in Massachusetts, there's uh, track and signal improvements, uh, bridge drainage upgrades, uh, 38 at-grade crossings, the four stations that I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, and then uh, the uh, vehicles, the trains themselves. Uh, looking at uh, 40, 4 and a half miles of new double track, there's some double track that exists. Uh, so that the entire 62-mile corridor uh, would be uh, double track, uh, new uh, interlockings, and uh, safety control measures. Um, what what the scope of the project does not include are two really, really, really huge shops. Um, the Hartford uh, Viaduct uh, is not included. Uh, construction funds have not been uh, identified for either the viaduct or uh, the Con River Bridge uh, in Connecticut. So those two projects, next 10 years, are going to have to uh, move forward uh, when uh, Connecticut has identified uh, funding to provide them. So if we look just, just at the corridor exclusive of those two projects, uh, we're looking at a $650 million job. Uh, 470 of the 650 has already uh, been submitted. Uh, so there was a, a $40 million obligation, $121 million, and a $30, $30 million with $280 million of state uh, funding to match uh, the, the federal funding. So what that means, obviously,
obviously, is that they're not able to do everything. They've broken it into phases. Uh, Meriden uh, to Newington, New Haven to Hartford, Hartford to Springfield is phase three. So we're looking at uh, construction start uh, in 2014. They're in the environmental permitting phase right now uh, with operational start uh, in uh, 2016. Um, if I just go back, uh, the, what, I, what I did not mention is uh, Meriden to New, New, Newington is phase one. That is fully funded. Uh, New Haven to Hartford, fully funded. Hartford to Springfield, not fully funded. So the, the, the deficit between the 470 figure and the 650 overall figure um, would be in that phase three stage. That they anticipate uh, operating the service. Uh, it just won't reach its full potential until that phase three is finished. Um, finally, I just wanted to say a word uh, about the Union Station project here in Springfield. Uh, the uh, existing uh, structure, that's an artist rendering of, uh, of what the, the proposed uh, new gentrified project uh, will look like. Uh, the structure uh, where, where the building material changes, the structure in white uh, would be a new parking garage with um, all of the PDTA as well as all of the Peter Pan buses coming into and out of that white structure. Uh, the, uh, if, if you've ever uh, been uh, in Union Station from uh, the old days, uh, there uh, were we're on Frank D. Murray Street. This is the Frank D. Murray Street view of Union Station. Most of us, if any of us have uh, taken Amtrak, uh, you're not getting on and off Amtrak on Frank D. Murray Street. You're getting off a block uh, away. Uh, you're coming down the stairs, and you're exiting directly uh, out uh, onto Liberty Street. Um, when you come down to the bottom of the stairs, there's like a, a wall to your left. Uh, there, there's a tunnel that comes through into the main foyer of this structure that's still there. It's just blocked <coughs> off. And so we'll be able to connect the bus station and the Peter Pan buses and the uh, rail access all at one central hub. You may have read uh, last week that there was a $17 million uh, award to Springfield. It's the Springfield Redevelopment Authority that's managing this project. Uh, they, they had already secured 28 million. The additional 17 will be uh, what they need. Uh, so uh, within the next six months, we should see uh, the structure that currently exists uh, where the white structure is represented coming down uh, and construction beginning on that uh, new um, bus uh, depot and, and parking garage. So that's that's the overview, and I'm going to uh, turn it over. Mayor, how do you want to do it? Do you want to do questions at the end, or questions in the first now? Or? I thought we'd go through the presentation, and then we can just have everything else all over the floor. So let me get Kim fired up here. So, so we have uh, with us tonight Department of Transportation, Mass DOT, uh, Tim Doherty, who's the Director of Rail Programs. Uh, with him is John Ray, who's the Deputy Rail Administrator. I don't know if you have one more staff person I did not meet before. No. Okay, all right. So I'll turn it right over to Tim. Sure, you want to? It's not this. Uh, a project that you know Massa has been working on for a number of years, um, and it, it's really kind of exciting. Uh, and we'll, uh, figure out how to play with it. Yeah. Just use the push the button. Yeah. It worked for me. There we go. <laughs> um, about the knowledge 
shorter. Um, you need to be a little bit of a tour part of the project de definition in terms of what's, what's actually included in the project and talk a little bit about the schedule where we're at. Um, let me uh, begin. Um, I uh, started working on this project a number of years ago when I actually lived in, in Northampton um, and worked for the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, so it's been kind of fun to work on a project for, for a long time. Um, and this project really came out of sort of an interesting idea of continuing the work that Connecticut was doing at the time and extending it north. There was an opportunity to do that. We started having some conversations. We had some money to do a study. In the middle of a feasibility study, um, we entered into the Great Recession, and there was this idea of, well, why don't we do a high-speed rail program, and USDOT and Congress and, and the President came up with $8 billion that they decided to designate towards high-speed inner-city passenger rail. And I think that's that's important because it's both high-speed rail, which is the Piacella, and then inner-city passenger rail, which are a whole bunch of different little inner-city passenger rail programs, like the Down Easter, some of the other things around the country, and, and like our knowledge quarter. Um, and very quickly, um, we've put together a really good project that we've been working on. and. Uh, and in the State of the Union, it was announced that we got $72 million to do it. So let me back up with, this is really sort of the timeline of, what, of, uh, of the project. So Amtrak was created uh, in 1971 to take over the passenger rail service in the United States and really take it over from the freight railroads that had been running it as a private for-profit business. They were unable to do that they were losing a lot of money. And one of the ways to save the freight railroads and save that was to take over the passenger stuff. So Amtrak, Amtrak was created in 71. 72, the Montrealer was created uh, to provide service to Montreal through the Fire Valley. It was one of the first international services of Amtrak. Um, from 72 to 1989, the Vermonter traveled, or the Montrealer traveled through Northampton, uh, and then was suspended in that sort of period between 89 and 95, uh, and then created created basically the Vermonter, which was a date, basically moved the train from the nighttime to the daytime, um, and uh, stopped, going to, stopped going to Montreal, but then actually provided more service into Vermont. Uh, and then this, this effort really started in 2000, with Connecticut's work on Springfield to New Haven service, as well as the name the Knowledge Quarter was created. Uh, and 2003, to sort of show that it takes a really long time to do transportation projects, um, we had some of the first early meetings with mayors in Northampton and Holia to sort of say, hey, uh, mayors, what do you think about this idea? Uh, 2005, the feasibility study was funded. 2008, the feasibility study was started. Uh, 2009, basically, was the high speed rail program. Uh, and it was part of the stimulus, the RS stimulus project. 2010, the grant was received. 2011, uh, the grant was awarded to MassDOT. Uh, and the final design process that we're currently underway. And then in 2012, construction. So one of the benefits of the project, in addition to bringing inner city passenger rail service back to back to Northampton, um, because of the alignment of the corridor that, that sort of showed up there, um, in some of Dana's maps, is that it reduces 25 minutes of the travel time because the train would no longer go sort of this uh, two legs of a triangle over to Palmer and then up to. Um, the other benefit is there's on time performance, and then a 24% increase in ridership. And now I'll talk about a little bit about what's actually in the project, um, which is basically bringing the, bringing the train over here, the amount of the grant. I think the other thing that the folks in Northampton might be interested in is finally constructing a bicycle underpass, sort of the 
convergent of all the bicycle trails. This, is a, this was a project that had been sort of conceptualized for a long time and for a bunch of different reasons wasn't constructed. Um, sort of in the, in the last stages of the development of the Knowledge Corridor project, it, it became really sort of a critical safety issue and dropped it into the project as the stage smash um, to the uh, two point or seventy two point eight million dollar project. Uh, the rail project uh, also includes uh, basically new rail. So the steel that's there would be replaced. The steel that's currently there is going to be replaced with new rail for the full, full forty nine miles, uh, seven point five or uh, five point seven miles of uh, double tracking. Signaling system, the railroad signaling system, uh, would be rehabilitated, uh, doing some bridge work, and then lastly, uh, new stations in Northampton and Greenfield. In Northampton, uh, because this was an existing Amtrak station um, and was still there um, and not used for 20 years or so, uh, it, it was very very easy in the granite development process and some of the environmental work to just say, we're going to rehabilitate, rehabilitate it in the same place, we're just going to go back in, fix what's there, and then the station. Um, and so that's that's really what the, the grant did and the project is, is, is proposing to do. Um, in, the, in the same location that it was historically, and that's it basically adjacent to the Northampton uh, the Union Station uh, building. In Greenfield, um, maybe a, more, a little bit more than a coincidence, but there was a parallel project to build an intermodal transportation center in Greenfield um, that was located or sort of intentionally sited next to the next to the knowledge border with the thought that passenger rail may someday happen. Um, I don't think when the, that project was really in the development stage, they really expected it to happen as quickly as it did. That opened. Ago, um, and the Knowledge Border Project was basically put a platform adjacent to the building there. Um, and then it'll be a full multi modal center. And then a little bit about the implementation plan. The final design that I discussed is uh, underway through MassDOT um, with the MBTA. In this case, it's sort of important to sort of talk about the MBTA as partner in the project, but it's also uh, sort of this part of that as part of MassDOT facilitating the project and helping MassDOT out with a number of different items. Uh, materials are in procurement. Um, actually, the majority of, of the, the large uh, material items are either purchased or about to be purchased. Pan Am Southern, the owner of the right-of-way, um, will install all the materials. Starting now, a lot of work's going to happen now. A lot of work's going to happen. A lot of work is going to happen, for example, in the summer, and quite a bit next year. Started to participate in early planning for cleaning. Um, I'll just throw a little bit uh, sort of a larger vision for Massachusetts in terms of where some of the other projects are working on. Um, the Knowledge Border Project is the first one, the Down Easter Project, which is the service which Boston and Portland, Maine, um, the Haven Hartford Springfield project, uh, which we spent a lot of time working with Connecticut on, um, and then substation expansion, which is a project that will expand capacity in Boston um, for service into Boston, both from the south and from the west. Um, and this talks a little bit about our different, um, different, different corridors. First, start with the committee and just see if we have any immediate questions for our guests uh, specific to the project here in Northampton, specific to, I don't know, for example, you've mentioned.
mentioned some rough timelines. Do you have any specific timelines about when? Um, I know you said you're starting sort of to the north of us with some of the track improvements. Do you have any timetables around when those kinds of things will be happening in Northampton? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the way the project's kind of broken up is again, the first thing you have to do is put ties into the track. The rail's been ordered. The rail's going to start showing up in uh, mid-August. Um, can't really install the rail, so you have something you can nail it down to. So the first thing they're doing is running out ties. That process is ongoing right now. Ties are being delivered, being spread out along the tracks. They actually started in the north field. They're going to work down to Greenfield. Try to get all those ties installed so when the rail train shows up in mid-August, they'll lay the rail out adjacent to the track so the rail crews can start installing rail on track that's been upgraded with new ties. At the same time, the tie work will continue south of Greenfield, heading towards this location, and, and on towards Springfield, trying to stay ahead of the rail lane uh, process behind it, so that there's always, whenever the rail goes in, it's going in on top of new ties. But if we don't want to, if we lay the rail out, new rail out in front of the tie installation, the new rail is actually laid on the side of the tracks, which then interferes with the tie exchange. So that process, we're trying to make sure that everything is done in a, in a logical order. Um, at the end of the process, after all the rail is installed, um, the tie work will actually then restart and continue to put in additional new ties underneath the, the, the rail that's been installed. So to begin with, we're only going to put in roughly 1,000 ties a mile to hold the track, keep the track uh, very stable, so when they put the rail on top of it, it will actually stay where they, where they uh, put it in. Um, the tie work in earnest will probably begin within the next couple of weeks. The tie uh, just the distrib distribution of the ties is ongoing right now. Um, they'll, they'll put in someplace around 1,000 to 1,200 ties a day. So we need to get a substantial number of ties laid out in front of the, the actual installation crew. So that's what we're doing now is trying to make sure the ties get, get laid out. Uh, so that there's a number of days work in front of the crew at all times. Um, um, I would say that you know the tie distribution and, and the tie work will you know, it'll get here fairly quickly. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's um, you know, a day, a mile, roughly, uh, coming out of uh, Northfield, which is about 449, so. And, uh, and some of the other uh, the grade improvements that you were talking about, the grade. Those, those will happen independently as they go through all the dig safe, and that, that's still in the final design right now. They're probably at 60% now, I think. 60%. I mean, the, 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 some of the crossing work would take place this year. And but that happens independently. It's very site specific. You can coordinate around the other work that's going on, you know, avoiding, you know, events in a municipality or, or something else that's going on. And once the design is ready, they can go in and just push that that piece of um, you know, improvement, rebuild, grade crossing in, in front of it. The signal system is um, is in design now. Until that gets to about 90% completed, you can't even order the material. So the, the big rush now is to get that design of the signal systems um, completed. Um, at about 90 percent, then they'll order all the material. Hopefully, that material will be constructed and tested over the winter, and installation of the signal system will begin next spring. Um, you know, those are kind of the, the big items. There's culverts that have to go in. There's um, brush removal in places. There's uh, you know, so, still some bridge um, engineering work that needs to take place. Uh, so there's, there's still quite a bit of work going on at many different levels, to, uh, and all at the same time. Get this to a, a point where it can be done. The goal right now is to finish all the construction activity by December 31st of next year, um, and then there'll be some commissioning and testing and all that that happens uh, with a again, like Daniel had said, spring 2014, uh, relocating the service from the uh, the Amherst Palmer route over to the uh, Do you are these going out bid project by project? Most of the work right now is because Pan Am owns the property, Pan Am Southern. Uh, they're gonna, they, there's an agreement in place, construction agreement that's already been signed that has them doing most of the work. Okay. Um, there are a bunch of um, construction contracts that will also go out, um, like brush cutting and ditching and um, support of construction at grade crossings and, and things like that. So there'll be another of other somewhat, somewhat specialized contracts, but also some general contracting. Things like the rail trail crossing that Tim mentioned, the, the under 
tunnel and um, and the Damon Road intersection improvement with that great process? Like, will those specific projects be designed, and do you have a chance to look at those designs, or when will those be? Oh yeah, uh, as a matter of fact, we, we've got um, in in the for the the tunnel underpass, um, you know, the thirty percent then reviewed by. Um, Superintendent of Public Works, I believe, uh, already, um, and 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 those comments are being in, integrated into the next uh, revision on the design. Uh, the Damon Road needs to go a little bit further. It will involve Mass Highway, which is Mass Dot Highway Group, as well as the Mass Dot Rail Group, and and of course the local uh, uh, traffic folks also. Uh, Damon Road is one that's going to take a lot of back and forth to make sure we get that right. Does that include a traffic light? Then? Oh, absolutely. What is high stream? I haven't heard any numerical number attached to it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's um, right now the design is for 79 miles an hour. The, um, that line used to be double track much of the way, but you're only planning on reinstituting double track on two and a half miles? Well, there's, there's two and a half miles of, of um, double track, but there's also another 5.7 miles of, of sightings. But it's, it's it's based around you know, what's an anticipated level of use. If the level of use goes up, there is room to put uh, the double track back in, in, in many more areas. But it does make sense to spend the money on it now, especially if you don't have the money, uh, to uh, even, even try to you know, go looking for money for something you're not going to use right away. Um, Large parts of Dana's presentation talked about the future, which is a great number of trains that I thought would only be talked about when commuter rail took place. This, this couldn't be an MBTA-run operation. Is it going to be another passenger rail authority created here to operate this north-south line? Well, I mean, to begin with, what we're talking about is moving the Vermonter, which is an Amtrak-operated train. All right, it'll become the Montreal or Connecticut back to Montreal. It will be Amtrak-operated. Uh, and then all of the service that, that Dana was talking about between Springfield and New Haven is also amtrak -operated. There is an opportunity to do something w without Amtrak, but I think for right now, you know, Amtrak's a big player and they have the equipment and the people and the resources in the area, so it makes sense to, to stay with them. If there's a, another way of doing it that makes more sense, then, then the door could be open to uh, something other than Amtrak. Are you talking about welded rail coming back here, or is it going to be 39 foot section? It will be 136 pounds continuous welded rail, dropped off in, I think, 1,440 foot strings when it A lot of money being spent without going to the real golden Nirvana destination in Montreal. But I mean, the goal is to get there. Um, you know, we, we do have, and separate from this project, but definitely related to this project, we have lots of meetings with, with the government of Quebec about how to get the cross border transportation and you know, the, the, uh, you know, the security problems that that brings up and all the rest of it. They're working you know, very hard to try to cure that. The government of Quebec really wants. Montreal are back, and, and as we, uh, that does a few things. Because I've been on that train crossing the border outside north of Montreal, north, excuse me, north of Plattsburgh, and there's a 40 minute delay, and that track is 20, 20 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. so that, this is the more logical route. The, the border crossing itself is, is one of the big time um, crunches in the, in the whole trip. Um, and what they're trying to do is to set up a basically a, a border crossing inside of the train station in Montreal. So you will actually get checked through into the United States while you're still in the train station or the train, and the train won't have to stop at the border. Mm -hmm. They're working through all those details. It's you know, well beyond the transportation department, but it's, you know, we, we know that it's going on. We're having lots of discussions on it, and they, they are reporting significant strides towards accomplishing that goal to be able to make the trains. Plus, they leave the station, you'll go across the border, and you won't There's a study going on just just starting um, to look at the inland loop on on how to how many trains could logically fit through there, um, you know what kind of benefits would it have, um, you know so that's it's just kicking off right now. Uh, it's a 
And one of the big things is it is CSX's main line between Worcester and, and Albany, uh, uh, South Kirk, New York. Um, they did single track a lot of it over the course of time. Um, their traffic is growing substantially in the area. So, you know, the capacity that's available out there is very limited. So it's, it's trying to find out how could we actually schedule train, passenger trains when people would want to ride them and avoid the freight trains at the same time. There, there is uh, one Amtrak train a day currently. Uh, the Lakeshore Limited uh, travels uh, on that route uh, between Springfield and Boston once a day. Yes, it's a long trip. Just following up on the speed question, what would the kinds of speeds we'd be talking about just in within sort of in city limits here, like in the King Street area, you know, slowing down to the station, et cetera? What are those? I've, I've heard from constituents who live along those areas who are concerned about the speed and stuff like that. Yeah, well, the speed, when I, when I say 79, that's a design speed, it's a maximum authorized speed. When you hit 80 miles an hour, it changes a whole bunch of different uh, design criteria, so that's why it's 79 and not 80. Um, but, um, you know, you, to, slow, to stop at a station, you're going to have to, every curve requires you to slow down. Uh, there's a number of things that will, will change the, the, the speed. Uh, if you look at a railroad timetable, the speeds jump all over the place depending on where you are uh, within, within uh, the railroad. Um, you know, the tangents that are north of here, I mean, there's, I don't know, there's 15 miles of track or something, they'll be going 79 in those areas. When they come towards the town here, they, immediately the track starts to weave through the town. And it, it forces the trains to slow down because of the curvature. And then the stopping in the station and then accelerating back out of the station you know, keeps you at a much lower speed. Uh, I don't have the exact here, but um, you know, it's part of the design to actually identify what the speed is for every port of track. I was curious, do any of our Bridges need any reinforcement for any of our current abutments or any of our current. We haven't, we haven't, we haven't identified any yet, but there's still a lot of bridge work that needs to take place, you know, bridge inspection work that needs to take place. So you know, it's, it's not unlikely that there won't be some work that needs to be done. All of the bridges will get completely retimbered, so all the, the track work that's on top of the bridges will be replaced. Um, and if, you know, part of peeling off the old track and making the bridge get a better, much better view of it. But they'll, they're going to go through the whole rating process of every bridge on. Are you thinking about painting the bridges at all, or? No. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, that's been a, for Ward 3, that's been a long-standing issue. Is, uh, that there's graffiti all over the side that we see and stuff. Uh, the, the rail work, um, is it noisy? The, const the actual construction? The put it, I, I would imagine it would be. Um, I mean, it's, there's a lot, I mean, there was some, Dana actually has some good pictures there, but it, it's a bunch of small pieces of diesel-powered equipment spread out over a long distance. And is it done just during the day, or does it get done at night, or? No, it'll be, well, it'll be done during the day. Okay. Uh, right. And, and it, it can be done at night, but nobody on the railroad likes to do it at night. It's just too dangerous. You've got probably 18 pieces of equipment that are working, you know, 20 or 30 feet apart, and then people have to walk in between the pieces of machine. You just can't put enough light on the on the right. uh, job to make it safe. Well, I'm sure the neighbors will appreciate that. <laughs> um, I mean, things like running out the rail when the rail train comes to lay off to actually peel out the rail. Once that job starts, they'll they'll work until the rail train's empty. So that could happen overnight, but they're but they're traveling, you know, five miles an hour. So we're so there might be house right now, 20 minutes later, that'd be, you know, half a mile down the road. So there might be some noise. Yeah. There could be. Yeah, but we're not going to hear months of noise. You won't hear it two nights in a row. Okay. 20 minutes will be like. Yeah, all right. Um, the, the tunnel for the, um, the bikes, the, you're saying the design's at 30%? It's, it's beyond. The 30% review was, was already conducted, um, and yeah, yeah, we went on to 60%. And how, how long does, will, will that take to um, implement that, to, to construct the tunnel? I'm, I'm asking yeah. in terms of the, na the North Street neighborhood right now is <laughs> having their street redone. And then, and I, these are all great improvements. Just to, is, is that other street going to get, what's the name of the street? Woodmont. 
the wood mine can get no. Well, the, the tunnel is only on the railroad property, and then there'll be you know, this grading of the, the bike path as it continues up to the street's edge. Um, I mean, it's going to be, it's, you know, it's going to take some time to do that job. Does it take a month or two? Or? No, well, there'll be a lot of preparation work, but my guess is it's, it's concrete boxes. They'll come in with a big crane, right. cut the railroad out of the way, set the boxes in, and then start back filling around it. Hopefully, probably trying to do it over a week's, week's time. Okay. Uh, so it's months and months. But there'll be, I mean, then there'll be grading, grade alls out there, grading the and seating and you know, lights being <coughs> installed and, and things like that that'll happen around that. But the big work, the, the actual tunnel itself, will happen relatively. I mean, the, the freight railroad has to continue to operate, so they, they'll they'll be able to withstand a week's worth of time without without being able to get a train by. But they can't really take much more than that. So. Um, Economic, in terms of the site for the, the depot, do, does the, the project include um, working with seeing the development of that site, or or is it just the platform? When we talk about stations, we're talking about just the platform. It's a boarding platform. Um, it will include you know benches and lighting. Um, it will include you know some kind of a shelter. Um, but it's, it's that's really what it is. It's not. There's no building, it's not something with doors and windows, it's, 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 uh, it's just a, a, a boarding area. Um, you know, it could become there, something more than that, but it's, that would be outside the project that's currently financed. Is there going to be long-term parking provided with, because I'm anticipating people might drive in, hop on the train? We've, we've got a prediction of what would be necessary for long-term parking, but you know, that's, These are that's, some that's, that's the process that you, you okay. plan, and everybody's going to be participating. My understanding is that that location is not a long-term solution. Is that correct? That that platform. Well, that, that's where the, I think that's obviously where the platform will be built right now in the near term, and I think we may we may have a conversation about where you know, if we wanted to go with a multimodal style center, then we may look for other things. But at this point, we can really keep and in the near term, this is more term that we're working with. Exactly. Yeah. We're still using that. Several years ago, several commuter trips on rail trains and amshaft style shelters. Will they have a ticket kiosk or anything like that, or will all be beyond board ticket sales on board? Yeah. And, and, and Amtrak is, you know, we're still working on their quick track machines so they can put them the vending machine. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, they haven't rolled them out too many places yet, but where they have put them, they've been fairly successful. So uh, if you can get one of those. Works with the elements, uh, then um, you know, it might be something to be done here. But other than that, it would be on board. To follow up to Jim's question about the graffiti and the problems of communicating with the existing freight rail operators, which are not unknown. The project here will be purchased by the Commonwealth and they're giving Can Am Builder a role in providing the forces to remediate the track, but they won't be in control any longer once it's done. They will be merely the freight operators, that correct? Well, you, you're kind of putting things in front of each other. Yeah, but right now, they will, under this project, the way it was put together, Pan Am retains the ownership. And they, for the improvements that are being made out there, they would allow not only the existing Vermonter, but additional Amtrak service to be operated over the rail line. So they would remain in charge of maintenance, dispatching, and their own freight operations. And they're still going to be owner of the track. There's a separate process going on, which is, is going to change that. Uh, and we expect that that will probably be announced here in, in Northampton. Uh, but you know, we're, we need to get to that point at this at this time. But the, the Commonwealth has made um, has in, engaged in conversations and negotiations. And we've all but signed a document that would have that change hands. So that at that, that point, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts would now own the rail line. And Pan Am would be, or Pan Am Southern would be a freight rail operator. They would retain a, an exclusive freight easement for themselves to operate over the rail line. Um, and then they could also, at that point, still be the dispatcher of the rail line. Uh, but at that point, they would be a contractor and not an owner.
actual work itself, are there any environmental issues? I assume that there's, that there's a lot of uh, stuff that's been, been there for many. I know when we've done our rail trail projects, we've run into, is it coal ash? Or, uh, yeah, you can find things like that. Like that. Uh, you know, right now what happens is, you know, we're not bulldozing anything out of the way and signing. We're going to be replacing, you know, they got one bad type, we're going to good type taking the, the old rail off, put new rail on. So the idea is that none of that rail line is going to be, is, is to be disturbed. There'll be places like at the tunnel where the rail line gets completely excavated out and anything that's tested that needs to be disposed of would have to be disposed of properly. Well, I was looking at the feasibility study and saw where the noise vibration or look at the noise would be concentrated. And it was very close to a lot of houses. And when then I realized there was going to be one train going, one train coming, I found it manageable. Um, but that process for, from going from one train to 23 or 24, I can't remember what you said, sounds like um, that might increase the noise element in, in our well, area. Yeah, first of all, those that big change in the number of trains yeah. is from Springfield to New Haven. Oh, okay. All right, it doesn't come up here. It, there'll be, you know, the, the goal is to get more service up here than just one round trip, but it, it's not ever been envisioned that it would get to be those kind of numbers. So, pursuant to that, once rail service returns to the area, are we looking at more or less one round trip a day in the proposed kind of initial build out phase? Right now, there's only one train, one round trip train in, in the picture. Uh, but we are working separately to look at some of the trains that currently turn at Springfield and head back to New Haven to see if there's a way to move those trains further north. Um, and, and that's really what we're trying to work on now. There's no, no plan for anything like that at this time, but if the Commonwealth owns the asset, then it opens the door so we're able to run more. But when we choose to do that, it's going to be a function of you know, what it costs to do it. Um, and, and quite frankly, what's the demand for it? Those things will become available to do with Commonwealth ownership. I assume one of the issues we're going to have to, when we make the transition uh, back from the Vermonter little triangle that you described back over here, we're going to have to really work in coordinating some of the other transportation for folks that are get from Amherst to through Northampton. Has that also been part of MassDOT's planning? I, I can actually speak to that. The PDPA operates uh, bus service between uh, Amherst and Northampton, and it's um, pretty much half hour, 20 minute service between those two locations. And right now, there's one uh, train a day that's going north and one train a day that's going south. So uh, to think uh, that the, the other thing that we noticed, uh, people, people go where the station is. So if I live in Northampton and I'm, I'm dead set on taking the train, I have to go to Amherst. When, when, we, when we looked at origin destination, we found, even though there were you know, a huge number of people boarding and alighting uh, the train in Amherst, they're not all coming from Amherst. They're coming from Greenfield, they're coming from Holyoke, they're coming from, from South Adelaide, they're coming from all around the region. And so I, I really, I don't think that there's gonna be this, this huge uh, void uh, of, of getting between, you know, Tim, what did you say when you, the, the, if you, if you get on a bus at Haggis Mall uh, at UMass uh, and travel uh, to... You go either way. If you, if you go either way, even if you get on a bus, if you get on a bus at Haggis Mall, So, Mayor, that, that's addressing anyone in Amherst that wants to get on at, you know, 1 o'clock in the afternoon or 4 o'clock in the afternoon 
train is going to have an ample opportunity to get from Amherst to Northampton. The other question that I hope this committee will think about and address is once the bus comes into Northampton, is there a better way to service uh, this station at its existing location or if you're thinking about a new location, that, that transfer between uh, you know, a, a, a person getting off from uh, a bus and, and getting onto the train. So where exactly are they going to get off the bus and how far do they have to go to get on the train? I, I think that that's uh, something that, that we didn't ever need to think about before now that we really need to be talking about. That's part of what's happening in Springfield by exactly. putting the two facilities next to each other. Yes. It seems like, uh, from what you've shown us, that this is a, a real long-term planning. I'm just wondering about the uh, long-term sustainability of it. I mean, if the, all the towns along the route are, are making changes and we're planning for the future, you know, what's the likelihood that uh, the flood is going to be pulled? And I, I mean, I know you have to read the tea leaves to see what's likely going to happen, but to make long-term changes and not know uh, the sustainability of it. Any comments? Well, I think, you know, it, it is tea leaves, but um, to begin with, you know, the Vermont has been able to withstand a lot of changes and a lot of, you know, adverse conditions and it's still there. Um, new, le new federal legislation has changed the way um, intercity trains are funded. Uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts now has to pay for the cost of the Vermont as it travels through Massachusetts. We also get to keep the revenue that's generated by people who bought within Massachusetts. Um, so you know, a 24 percent increase in, in ridership is a good thing to have happening at the same time. Um, the, if the Vermonter becomes um, the Montrealer again, ridership will go up even more so. Um, and will probably you know, justify additional train trips in that area. So um, you know, that, that will happen. I think the, the, the question, the, the service that's in question about funding for operations would be additional service beyond the Vermonter that, that, that would be out there you know, immediately after the construction work is completed. Um, you know, if we were able to extend service, uh, some of the existing Amtrak service into Springfield to bring it further north, you know, that needs to have a funding source that hasn't been identified yet. So that's, that's still a goal to be worked on. We're still working to find out the schedule because there are some benefits with doing that. Um, Amtrak has train crews that are sitting, not sitting, but Amtrak has train crews that are on trains in Springfield that have time in their schedule to be able to come further north. There's just no place for them to go today. What we're trying to do is to get a track speed that allows them to actually get to someplace meaningful and turn and become a more, you know, a more efficient operation by picking up and serving more people. Uh, is there a possibility of a connection in Windsor Locks to the airport? Yeah, that's a big part of the Connecticut plan. Yeah, absolutely. And it would not be um, a rail link. There, there is a rail line that goes uh, from Windsor out uh, to Bradley, but it takes almost uh, a 90 degree turn, so the train pretty much has to come to a complete stop. Much, much quicker, cheaper, more efficient to run a, a, a shuttle bus. The shuttle bus is waiting when the train comes in, takes all the passengers directly mm -hmm. to the airport. So, so that's uh, what's envisioned. Uh, for the Bradley So we heard questions from the committee. I wonder, if folks who turned out tonight, are there questions that you haven't heard that you'd like to have from the audience? Or sort of anyone out there who has a question? Okay, we've got a couple hands. So um, I think the gentleman in the Red Sox shirt is here first. Okay. Yeah. Put your hand went up first and then over here. So if you just stand and say your name. My name is Joe DeBlaze. I live at 27 Valley Street, Ward 3. Um, I have a couple of questions. One, the two basic presentations, and you, you gave short-term and long-term uh, timelines. They were very confusing because everything was packed together. Can you just give a three-year a three look at where we're at today and where we're going in the next <coughs> three years, and where, that's, where, where you expect this extra $200 million to come from <clears throat> for, for the funding between Hartford and Springfield to, to 
to, to, uh, to, to make up that $600,000? That's my first question. The second question is, um, in the, uh, the uh, ele electric station has railroad trains that, that come in every, uh, every day with coal. And uh, those, that co those coal trains <coughs> used to sit on the track going, going there before they went in, into, the, into the station. And then after the coal was burnt, it sat again on the track. And the debris was spread through the neighborhood as a pollutant. That's in Ward 3. Yeah, it's that's in Ward 3, as a pollutant. What's going to prevent this from happening again with all these changes in the, in the rail system? Those are the two questions. Oh, and I also wanted to, I'm part of him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to know about the, when the construction starts, about road uh, street closures. That, well, would the streets be closed in, in or during the construction and things like that? Yeah, I'll, okay, I'll try to remember each question as it went, but um, to start off with, the, the funding um, south of Springfield down into Connecticut, they're going to start with their project and they're going to build as much as they can. They just won't get the, the speed benefits that they're trying to, uh, because the service runs today between New Haven and Springfield. So that service will continue just as it does today. When you get to, um, and in fact, they actually have enough money almost to get to Windsor. Um, so they, when you, as you leave Springfield, the train will travel just as it does today. When it gets to Windsor, it can pick up speed and, and travel faster. Of course, it also makes it, you know, four, four additional stops on the, on the loop between there. So, uh, you know, there is, the, the improvements are, don't have to wait for all the money to be in place, but you will only get the benefit of the total package when all of the work is completed. Um, and so from a time point of view, what they're saying is, and one of my slides represented, there will be half-hour service is the ultimate. That's what we're working for, is half-hour service. The half-hour service will be able to be uh, instituted between New Haven and Hartford, an hourly service between Hartford and Springfield until we get the remainder of the funds. So they'll, they'll increase the service as the track works completed. Um, the other thing, the, um, the coal trains, I don't think there's been a coal train in a while now, right? Um, but that, there's nothing that we're doing that either benefits the coal train or, or, or uh, prevents the coal train. The coal train can still operate. It could operate tomorrow. Um, you know, the only thing that would happen is that the train could actually move faster than 10 miles an hour um, if, it, if the track has been completely rehabilitated. Um, but it, it still can do what it does today, and there's nothing that, you know, we're not going to be prevented from doing anything that would impair the ability of the freight uh, railroads from doing their business out there. And I think his confusion is frequently it looks as though it's stopped on the main line, and in fact, I think it's stopped on the side. Yeah, there's a, there is a siding in there. And, and, and the, all of the design of the track, um, between all the way from Northfield all the way to Springfield, has been. Um, reviewed and has been, um, the design is um, um, actually conducted for the most part with Pan Am in the room. So they've put in, made sure the tracks were there to continue their freight operations the way they, they currently do today. So there's nothing that would allow us in, to um, um, remove a track that was, that they needed to serve one of their customers. And then there's a road closure question. Yeah, and the road closures, they will um, happen um, every Every grade crossing, you know, they'll shut off the traffic as they do the the, uh, the rebuild of the of the grade crossing itself. But all of that gets uh, coordinated with the local police chief, who has to approve the traffic diversion plan before the road closure can take place. So uh, it'll be very site specific. Um, it'll be in advance. It, normally, what happens is they come out and they put up the variable message signs that say, you know, two weeks away from from today, you know, the crossing will be closed. Usually, it's over a weekend. Usually it's late Friday night, and it's back uh, open again on Sunday afternoon. Um, you know, if there's an event going on, or you know, there's some reason why it needs to be scheduled in a different time of the year, those things will be all taken into consideration um, when they when they go to uh, plan the closing. Uh, the gentleman right there. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Richard White, and just a point of clarification: um, when you talked about the build out on one of your slides, I think I presented it. You had WRJ to NH, which I took to mean White River Junction to New Haven, 20, 30, five trains. So what, is that five single runs? I mean, I'm thinking in terms of Northampton. Does that mean five trains a day passing through Northampton or 10 stops per day? It's, it's, it's five in each direction. Five, five in each direction. direction, so it's 10 stops per day. 
And would the build-up to that be, I mean, is, do you have sort of an incremental vision, or is that in response to market demand for what shows up past 2014? It's, um, those numbers are more for Connecticut's pro project in the sense that they wanted to come up with what's the maximum bill for that particular quarter. They were required to do that. And so in one sense, and so you, you basically say, I'm going to run a certain number of trains. Yeah. And so, yeah, it would be an incremental buildup. And the, the design allows for, <coughs> for that number. So right. you don't know right. Mass so stock doesn't really own you. Well, we, we participated in the in the process. The thing yes. is, that you, you end up design you end up sort of basically having to design a master schedule, right? Right. Okay. Because Northampton is fairly simple in the in the scheme of things, but yes. by the time all the trains flow into New York City in the New York right. Penn, yes. it's probably the most complex railroad operation probably yeah in this side of the world. Yeah. The, the, it's just, there's a limitation of what you can put in there, yeah. and what they said is, can you take a look into the future and tell us what, what would be the worst case that you try to put between Springfield and New Haven, so that they can design their track and signal system to accommodate it. Okay, but in terms of the alternative, I mean, I, 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 think, I, think, I think it's one of those things that, that Northampton, Northampton has the ability, as everybody in the room takes the train, to generate demand. That, were, that, yeah. that sort of says, well, all this, you know, there are 150 people every day getting on a train in Northampton, so maybe we need to add another train, yeah. and yeah. then add another train, and then add another train. Yeah. I mean, that, that's sort of how service goes. And, and, and so it's really, I mean, it, at the most basic level, if you want more service, right? Yeah. right so if there was enough, potentially, if there was enough demand, you could run up to five trains. Okay. If you get too much beyond those numbers, then kinetic. Connecticut DOT would have to start increasing the capacity right. okay. of the traffic okay. on Connecticut. Got it. Got it. Exactly. <laughs> um, am I clear that that through Northampton it's going to be basically a single track like it is today, modernized with one maybe one passing siding, or and you're going to keep the right of way for future expansion for two tracks? It, for most of the, the central business district here, it will be two tracks. Okay. Two, two tracks, tracks now, during the central. There'll be one only, the platform will be only be on one track. So the other track would be for moving trains while there's a train on that track or to pass two trains. Right. So that's, that's what's currently envisioned uh, for the design here. Is there anything that tells you at the present time, like running north, when the the limit of the passing siding, how far is it going to go? Um, it goes, it goes from basically underneath 91 that way. The 91, as you come off from the south side of 91, basically right, right there, up to just past where the bicycle underpass is. So actually, right before the bicycle. So okay, so it's double track from on the south from the 91 overpass all the way up to the bike trail crossing. Basically, and I'm off, I'm off by a little bit, but right. Yeah. Sir, yeah. Uh, my name is Bob Goodman. Uh, I live in Franklin Street here in Northampton, uh, and I, it happens that I just happen to be doing uh, research on train systems around the world, including the United States. And I have one simple question. This is called a high-speed train. <laughs> and if I heard it correctly, the top speed is 79 miles per hour. So the question is, why is this called high-speed train? In Europe and other countries, high-speed trains you know, start at around 150, 160 miles an hour. <laughs> they average, you know, 180 and have top speeds over 200 miles an hour in some places. How did this get designated as a high-speed train? In 1932, the United States had trains that went over 110 miles an hour. 
So again, same question. So we're still back. Um, this is a high-speed corridor. It's not quite high-speed trains. You have to look at the There's like trains and trains. The general description is like definition is trains at 110 miles an hour are called higher speed. They're not even called high-speed trains. So, but I don't think anybody suggested we're going to be coming through Northampton with trains in excess of the 79. It doesn't make sense. Um, but this corridor, at some point in the future, you know, you know, gas at $12 a gallon, you may see something like that. This may become a, a high-speed line. Um, but it's probably not at the top of anyone's list because there's other places with a lot more people that need would need the same kind of um, um, transportation if, if gasoline wasn't that high. But it is a designated high-speed uh, alignment. Um, Can I just ask one question? Sure. You mentioned it's going to be uh, welded rails, which is what you need for high-speed trains. But what about the alignments? Well, Will those work for 150 miles an hour? Well, I mean, tangent track is good for 150 miles an hour. Um, you know, the signal system would have to be set up for that because to stop a train is really what you're worried about. Not right. how fast it can go, but how long does it take to actually stop it. So at 150 miles an hour, you need a signal system that's designed for that kind of braking distance. Um, so that's really what it comes down to. You know, some of the curves to Northampton would cause the train to be slowed down considerably. You know, get down in Holyoke. Uh, you know, those curves down there, you know, you'd be lucky to hit 40 miles an hour, uh, no matter what kind of train set you have, so. Mr. Reed. Yeah, Dave Reed from uh, Northampton Media. This, this $73 million grant, while well, it does provide a platform here in Holyoke and an underpass for the bike, uh, for the bike rail trail, it doesn't provide any equipment, I mean, new rail cars or Amtrak locomotives, but especially rail cars, would you still be using the same, Amtrak still be using the same stock that they were running, that they're running now or ran 10 years ago? Yeah, it's just, it'll be the same train sets. I mean, theoretically, the train that's running today um, down through Amherst through Palmer and into Springfield would be the same train set at the end of this project that would run down through Northampton. So no, there is no equipment that's being purchased as part of it. Um, I do need to correct you because it's a total of $75 million project. That includes the, the underpass, but it does not include at this point the station in Holyoke. It's only Greenfield platform and the Northampton platform. So they're getting, they've gotten some other grants to. Uh, and we're to working with them to try to help them with that and to try to find a way to make that happen because it makes sense to have a platform down there. So you know, we're engaged with the town down there to, to see what we can do about you know getting the right location and getting a station uh, uh, in, the, in the city. Of, and uh, and just to follow up, uh, there's no, also no money in. It, it was said before, there's no money in this project for a an actual station other than the platform, which we, we had at the end of the last time mm -hmm. the rail ran on this, you know, on yeah. this bed. So that would be, uh, are, are, there, are there federal monies out there for other projects like this to, that would help them get stations? I know Union Station got some money, it's not from the FRA, though, is it? Yeah, I mean, station, I mean, what, what goes on at a station, and we'll share some stuff with the, with the committee here, but what goes on at a station is um, is really based on the number of passengers that use it per day. Um, and, you you know, you, if you don't have a lot of foot traffic going through a, a place, then putting a building there is not something, it's, it's, it, it's a drain on money. You talk about having enough money to run the operation, putting a building there, you'll spend more money trying to provide upkeep on that building than you will ever spend on running the train that, that carries the passengers through. You, were, you all were talking about the numbers, uh, you know, if you, for Amherst, uh, the people are going to the Amherst uh, platform station are coming from all over the place. Uh, I, I would surmise that, that a lot of people who go to Springfield aren't in Springfield. I mean, some of us go to Springfield take the train, or we go to New Haven, which where the station's you know, real beautiful. It's, right. So, you know, I, I guess these numbers will pan out over time. Yeah, and that's what you have to see. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's always a reaction to demand. Based on the current projections here, it will be a while before you could ever justify putting a, 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 an enclosed building at, at Northampton. Not to say you won't do it if you find something else that you can do with the building, but it's just to serve the state, the, you know, the passenger at the station. It just wouldn't make sense for, for so you've got quite a few more passengers. Yes. Yeah. I just want to say it's a fantastic project. I understand question they had concern that siding. You know, some track owners kind of look at siding as three-story space and the potential for seeing a line
giant gondola is holding scrap metal for a week, uh, uh, it certainly presents itself a number of towns and valleys that face that from time to time. Um, can there be a sort of covenant so that that's, that's looked at as an active, do, active use uh, uh, siding rather than a storage yard? Yeah, I guess, well, first of all, we can't put a, that kind of covenant on because if the freight railroad decides that they need to do that in order to run their freight business, they have the rights to do that. However, I can tell you that it was designed to be a passing site so that when there's a passenger train at the platform, they'll be able to move a freight train by so that if the passenger train, let's say, comes south and stops at the platform, a freight train coming north can go in on the siding and get by it so the passenger train can continue. You can't do that if you leave cars sitting there. So it's designed as a passing track, not as a storage track. Um, Quick follow up, so, but, but if the city allows that to be built, then Amtrak could, on its own, free and clear, use it as a storage site. Well, Amtrak, well, I mean, I'm guessing you mean Pan Am? I, I meant Pan Am. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, they could. Um, that looks like they could do it today. But then, well, there is just single track, isn't it? Well, it, there's, a, there's oh, actually two tracks there, but it's only connected at one end, oh, and it's, right. it's not maintained <laughs> in, really, uh, in a condition that they could do that. But they could actually come in and do it today. They don't need permission from either Mass DOT or, or the town or uh, city or anybody else for that matter. They can come in and do what they want today. Um, it's less likely to happen if it gets built as a passing site because they'll need that in order to run their business. The old Ames, uh, <clears throat> Crescent Street. Um, I, I got a little confused over who owns the track because when I <clears throat> went out to St. Louis on the train, um, no, it wasn't to St. It was um, out further west so into LA. The passenger, the Amtrak doesn't own the track, so that we constantly were pulled off onto a siding and uh, maybe as many as three freight trains went whizzing by while we sat there and watched. So they own the tracks, the, the uh, I guess it was the Southern Pacific or something. If uh, Pan American South owns the track, the it, you won't have to worry about uh, freight trains holding junk. It'll be passenger cars sitting there waiting for the for the uh, freight train to go by and the coal cars and all that sort of thing. So what sort of priority does Amtrak have? Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, Amtrak does have priority um, on passenger trains. There's also a very um, um, beneficial, and I don't have the exact terms of it because we're not entitled to have those at this point, but, um, but there's a, what they call a host railroad agreement that was signed between Amtrak and Pan Am Southern. Uh, in that, it, it, it identifies who gets the right of way, um, and in that case, passenger trains are entitled to the right of way. If if Pan Am is able to move the passenger trains um, within a, a defined um, time period, there's actually a fairly large incentive payment that Amtrak pays to Pan Am for doing that. Um, so there's a there's a big dollar incentive for them to move the passenger tra trains along. Um, unlike coming out of LA, which is the biggest port in the United States. Um, freight trains pay uh, the railroads a lot more money than oh. passenger train um, mm. uh, incentive Absolutely. payments could ever amount to. So you can see that would happen. But to take that even a step further, the Commonwealth is also um, in the process of um, and hopefully very close to acquiring the ownership of the rail line, which means that at that point, um, even if Pan Am stayed and continued to dispatch the trains out there, they would be doing that as a contractor to Mass DOT. Um, if they did it right, they would continue to dispatch. If they did it wrong, we'd find somebody else to do the dispatching. Um, but the passenger trains have to have, when you, if, the, if the train's going to be there a certain time, the train has to be there. That's the only way you're going to show people that it's worthwhile to even think about taking the train. So that's the most important thing that we can do out there is to come up with a schedule that's realistic and then hit that schedule every time. Well, uh, just to follow up on that, if I might, um, when I took the train from Phoenix to uh, L.A., it was eight hours late. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know where it got held up. It was eight hours, or about five hours late when it got to Phoenix, and then we lost three more going over to L.A. 
And part of that was waiting for freights, but I, th I guess that was built into the schedule. So that shouldn't have added three hours, but somehow it did. No, you were lucky. So, <laughs> I can just tell you that. Living there and, it got better and had worse time than that. Yeah. I mean, we, we can only control, um, and we don't even control that, you know, with, with much much teeth. But with the, what happens within this, the knowledge car, the Massachusetts portion of this rail line, you know, if a train gets delayed coming out of St. Albans and it gets to the border late, it's going to be late coming through mm. Massachusetts, yeah. and we can't do anything about that. I can tell you that we meet with the agency of transportation up in Vermont all the time, and that's what we talk about, is how to avoid these delays. They want very much for this rail line to get rebuilt so that it can be used, and they can be sure that the train is being delayed in Massachusetts on its way to Vermont. Mm -hmm. So, you know, each of the states is relying on its adjoining states to, to help make sure that the throughput happens the way it needs to. Um, Amtrak owns the rail line between Springfield and New Haven, so they already control that. So that's that takes one of the bigger variables out of the way. Um, you know, eventual MassDOT ownership from, from Springfield to New, uh, Northfield helps very greatly with that. And then, you know, of course, you know, what happens in Vermont, they own, Vermont owns a lot of rail, but they don't own that particular section. Um, Stretching mic, or is that a question? Is that a question? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, is Pan Am coming up with any figures when the track is done as to how much they're going to increase their number of trains daily into negotiations on this? Um, they have to have customers that are located someplace along here to make it <laughs> worthwhile, and you know, most of those customers have, have dried up um, you know, over the course of time. Uh, you know, if so, most of, so most of the freight traffic is generated by the few sites that there are in Holyoke and north of here. So there probably won't be a big increase in number of... Yeah, I mean, we don't, there's no way for us to tell. I mean, you know, it could be some, some big warehouse company that wants to, you know, move into a cornfield someplace and, you know, they, you know, who knows? We don't know right. what's going on, but it's, it's with their business. But at the end of the day, you know, we kind of just look at it and say, they have these many trains that run out there today. They don't seem to be out trying to, um, you know, build up more, more traffic in the area. But once the rail line gets rebuilt, they do have the opportunity to move through more efficiently. I mean, today it's 10 miles an hour. They leave East Deerfield with a train, they can't really go down and back in a single ship. When it's 40 miles an hour, which is what the freight train maximum authorized speed would be, they now have the ability to come down and back in a, in a single day. That may encourage them to go out looking for more business. But, it's, but when they get business, it's a business in one of the cities or towns along the line that are, that are really where the, the, uh, they're serving. We'll just do a couple more questions. Um, yes, go ahead. Uh, Gina Norton, Mark Nathan. At some point, will there, or have there been discussions about what service there's going to be at Northampton stop and the Greenfield stop and the by that I mean um, beyond passenger just walking over their stuff? Will there be uh, baggage service? Has there been discussion about that? Um, because hopefully there will be. And um, if we have baggage service, my understanding is that Amtrak only allows uh, certain things to be loaded at baggage stops. And one of those things would be bicycles. And um, I think that the stops in Vermont, the stops here in the Valley would be interested in having people be able to use that as part of their commuting. Well, will we get to have that discussion at some point? Or input. I, I think that discussion needs to be with Amtrak because they are the service provider. It's really what they want to be able to handle it at, at a station the size of, of, of Northampton. Um, but you know, we can. I'm sure you can engage Amtrak that's in that's that conversation with the same committee. Yeah, that's the kind of input we're trying to get from the community that we can then present to Amtrak and solve these things out. That's great. I would think that based on the, the numbers of boardings that are currently projected in Northampton, that baggage is probably not something that they would be considering. But bicycles are something that we would be encouraging from day one, um, is to make sure that bicycles can be brought on the train, um, and that it's a place to put them when you get them on the train. Mm -hmm. Bike lockers. That sounds like uh, an amenity the town could, uh, city could easily put out there. <laughs> so, uh, let's see if there are any more hands. Uh, Richard, do yep. you have another question? Just one last question, when you said, you know, the, what the projected boarding might be for Northampton. 
Um, do you all have anywhere uh, like a publicly available? Oh, this is the study we did that interested folks could take a look at. Yeah. Where would we find? Yeah. If you go to pbpc.org mm -hmm. uh, and there's a, a couple of tabs, and if you click on the transportation tab, and then go down to publications. Okay. Could I just ask about the commuter rates that you might know? I, that you might think what the commuter rates would be? Uh, I know the commuter rate between New York and New Haven is pretty inexpensive. You know, it makes it a pretty cheap trip. Do you have any idea what it might be for a train to come up here and uh, what the rate would be? I think for right now the easiest thing to do is to look at, the, the, you're talking about the fare structure. Yes, the fare. Uh, yeah. um, is, you know, whatever, whatever the fare is at, Amherst is probably very pretty comparable to what it would be here. So it won't be changing? I mean, there, there will always be changes. Yeah. They change fare structures all the time, but, mm -hmm. but I think for right now, to get a you know a comparison to what, what the ballpark would be, it would be very similar to what Amherst So there be. won't be any subsidi subsidization of uh, fare rates for people who want to use the rail for commuting purposes? Um, I, I think right now it's being envisioned as more of an inner city, intercity type of service not a commuter service. I mean, I suppose if it develops into a commuter service, then that, that could change. But it, it is going to be, um, the operation will be somewhat subsidized because it costs a lot of money to move the Vermonter today. Um, and that, that cost is going to be passed on to the state um, so that even though it doesn't, it doesn't change because of the, the number of times you ride the train, there is uh, tax dollars in, in the operation of the train. So we're looking at Am Amtrak rate, rate schedule would be, the current, would, be, would be the rate schedule. It is, um, but there's, there's what they call PREA, which is the passenger rail Reinv uh, infrastructure and reinvestment, um, which f forces the cost of some of these rail operations back onto the states that, that where they operate. But that does, at that point, it, where it gives you the cost to operate the train, it also gives you the right to establish fare structures within the state. So there is an opportunity in 2014 when that law goes into effect that will allow the Commonwealth Massachusetts to look at it and to rationalize whether, you know, if we, geez, if we cut the price a certain amount, we'll double the amount of ridership. Uh, so those things are, are definitely a possibility, um, but it, it, it won't just be an outright subsidy because it, it's already costing money. In my discussions with Connecticut, uh, the, the fare, if, if you look at the fare from Springfield to New Haven today, it's it's really outrageous and that wouldn't, wouldn't pay to have this volume of service. So I think they're looking at a structure similar uh, to the one that uh, they use on the Down Easter that uh, Tim <coughs> mentioned earlier, where uh, the, the way that Down Easter operates, you buy a ticket and it doesn't matter what mode you take, whether you take uh, a, 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 a trailway bus uh, or, or you take the uh, you take the train, you take whatever vehicle is going at the time that you want to go, and I think that they would look uh, to a similar kind of mechanism where you would envision a fare similar to what you would pay uh, on the Peter Pan bus between uh, Springfield and New Haven. Just, if we have time for just one more comment, this is just a point of wrap up here, so. Just a point of information on fares and Amtrak. It turns out that, and people might know this, the, the line between Boston and Washington one of the few places on Amtrak that actually makes money and actually subsidizes some of the other parts of the system. Now, whether this improvement will, you know, do what you're saying uh, is a possibility. I have no idea, but there is a profitable part of the Amtrak system on the East Coast, which is Boston to Washington. I'm not so sure we'll ever get to that kind of service okay. level, but... Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Thanks for all those questions, and I, I want to thank our guests tonight, um, Mr. Dory and Mr. Ray, and also uh, Dana Roscoe from PDPC, and I think as we, we, this group meets and begins to formulate some of the issues and some of the questions that we hear from the community, um, could we, is it possible we could invite you back at some future date to give us updates on some of these, where some of these projects are and the status of them? I know people will be particularly interested in the platform accessible that will be, and, and obviously people will be interested in some of the other stuff, so I think if you're willing to come back, that would be wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Have you need us? Okay, great. Um, and I 
I want to thank everyone who came out tonight uh, for this first meeting, and uh, we're going to continue, I think, uh, now that we've sort of set the table, we'll have some future meetings to begin to talk about some of the issues that we want to work on and uh, how we want to try to get feedback uh, from the community on some of the issues that they want us to be able to, the city to bring forward to MCRAF, to match the OT, um, and, and we'll move we'll forward from there. So in the interest of uh, trains arriving on time, Okay, so we'll move to the next meeting. Thank you all for coming.